want to be really successful, you have to latch on to a bet. And what I mean by that is, you know, look at Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. He made the bet that people would buy things online. Right. That was his big bet. Now, what does he sell? Everything. Well, Patty, today you turn the tables on me. Ah, uh, it was fun, James. It was a really fun interview. Thank you for letting me do that. I, uh, you know, I've known you for a really long time, and I believe in the first year we did our podcast, I interviewed you and Christina on sort yeah, of. Oh, like, that's right. I forgot. Remember, about that. That was I was like, more interested in her. How, how did she? You yeah, know, yeah, of course. Back you up, and I heard some of those horror stories from your early days back in oh, those my. days. But, For foreclosures and uh -huh, cars. cars. And, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Story I forgot I about remember. that interview. That's a, that was a really good one, actually. I need to go back to that, that again. That was fun. We'll have to do that again for sure. But yeah. I really enjoyed this. I think people are going to, you know, get some good insights out of this. Thank you for letting me do that, James. Yeah, of course. And then uh, we went right into some news about Apple. Yeah, Apple and uh, Goldman Sachs. It's uh, what did I put it? Uh, the Golden Sour Apple. That's a good way to put oh, it. Oh uh, wow, very yeah, good. Yeah, so so stay tuned for that. That's an interesting story. I think you'll find. So this episode is brought to you by Nativia Banking. Just head over to nativia.com slash ISO ISO to learn more. Welcome everybody to the Merchant Sales Podcast. I'm your co-host Patty Murphy with James Shepard here. Hey everybody. Today we're gonna. Change, switch things up a little bit. And since I'm a reporter who always asks a lot of questions, I thought, wouldn't this be a great opportunity to interview James? Um, you know, I know a lot of people in the industry really know you well, James, but there are a lot of people who only know you through the podcast. And sure. maybe that's kind of new. So I sort of wanted to, you know, give people a feel for things, who they're listening to, why they're listening to us. There we and go. I like it. I like it. Maybe so, I'll even maybe I'll even turn a few of the questions on you, Patty, and we'll get some information. Uh, we'll get was, the insider was, scoop yeah. on you too. You know that happens to me often when I'm interviewing people. They'll be, "Well, what do you think?" I'm like, "I right. asked you that question." <laughs> right. Sure. Uh, anyway, well, let's start off with the question that you we always start off with is, "How did you find your way into this crazy industry?" Now, I know that you, I know that you're sales kind of oriented guy, but sure. how did you actually find your way here? Yeah. So interesting story. Um, I was in Chicago area. Um, that's where I grew up uh -huh. and I had a job at service master. So um, the way a lot of this started. So, you know, when I was in high school, I was actually much more interested in technology. I was a, uh, you know, developer, computer programming, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff. Um, I had, I had a retail job at a pet store. So I always was kind of into that kind of retail sales environment. And so I, right. I knew I enjoyed convincing people to buy things and all that. So then I got this job. I first kind of what I would consider a real job was at Service Master in the True Green Lawn Care Division. Okay. And um, when I joined, I joined as a salesperson because I I knew it's it's so funny to say this, Patty, because people would never imagine this about me, but I'm actually not an outgoing people person. <laughs> um, yeah, people would find that hard to believe. They would find that really hard to believe. I've I've had to like become that in order to accomplish mm -hmm. what I decided was my definition of success. So right. anyway, all that to say, I figured out, okay, well, I have to learn sales and I have to learn how to run a business if I want to be really successful. So I went and said, okay, I'll go get a sales job. And, and I figured cold calling on the phone to sell fertilizer to customers. I mean, what could be harder than that? Yeah, right. So I went and got that job. And within a few months of getting that job, um, and I had had several businesses before that, which I'm not going to get into. But when I started that job, a few months after the do not call list came out. Oh, Okay. Okay, and so for people that That's are tough. familiar, that was a tough time for well, yeah, because starting. businesses like Service Master, they they built all of their business based on cold calling consumers. Right. So the do not call registry coming out was kind of like the end of the world. You know what I mean for them? As they knew it, sure. Right. So um, I'll never forget my manager at the time, named Scott. He called me into his office and he's like, James, the corporate says we got to try this new thing of going door to door to sell lawn care. Ooh. He said, I think it's a terrible idea. I don't think it's going to work, but if you want to run it, you can. <laughs> and, oh, gee. I was like, wow. <laughs> so I was very entrepreneurial. And, and, and in fairness, I had told this guy when I interviewed initially that I wouldn't be there that long. I was an entrepreneur. I was going to start a business, but I told him that I would be the best salesperson he ever hired in his life. Uh -huh. and I, I would you know, work around the clock and all that. So right. he already knew that I was like entrepreneurial looking for a challenge and I wasn't, I wasn't looking at a long-term career. So he thought I would be a good person, which turns out I was. So I, I jumped into that. Um, he gave me two, he gave me the two worst salespeople <laughs> in the office. In the shop, probably. right? <laughs> no joke. Uh, anyway, they were not good. Uh, but I was at, you know, started training them and, uh, long story short, within a couple of years, we had about 30, uh, salespeople. 
Oh, wow. We were out door to door and it was fantastic. We were selling way more than they ever did over the phone, a much higher value, much higher retention, better customer experience all around the board. Huh. So I was very lucky because that put me in a position to skyrocket in the organization because right. I was the only guy, you know, and I was like 22 and I'm the mm -hmm. only guy in the company basically at that point that really knew how to do this well. There's right. one other guy actually that I'm still friends with that um, was, was doing it at a different branch. So anyway, uh, gave me the opportunity to travel around, to train other branches. And again, I'm a 22 year old making all kinds of money and, oh, this is You're great. Feeling high on your, on yourself. I'm sure by this yeah, point. Yeah. yeah. So then I got a job. Um, I moved, I, I left the company and started a, a real estate business that failed. Um, I had a, a Christmas light decorating business that took off and I just had a lot of different things going on. Uh -huh. So um, then my regional manager that was, you know, I'd become close with, he asked me to come back because there was a branch that lost their marketing manager. So I came back at the age of 23, right before I got married. Um, and anyway, all that say, long story short, service master got me into that sales mode. So when I moved out to Pennsylvania after I got married and uh -huh. I was kind of like, what am I going to do next? Right? right. But it has to be sales, right? It has I mean... to be sales because I knew that's where all the money was at. So right. um, at that point, I ended up getting recruited into a payment processing company. Um, it was called, uh, I think I can say the name now because I think the uh, attorney general officially shut them down in Texas a while ago, but it was Apex Merchant Group. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, they were just the absolute scam company. I mean, it was terrible. Yeah. I remember you telling me about that. Yes. Yeah. I didn't know it at the time. Obviously. Right. No, but I mean, later years <laughs> when we met, you told me about the first yeah. job you had. Yeah, it was pretty business. crazy. Yeah, yeah. So what I did is I would I was going out and I was selling these leases Mm -hmm. On the old hypercom, uh, the hypercom 4220s and 4210s. Okay, that? sure. Right, I remember terminal. those. Sure. Um, we were selling leases at $99 a month for 60 months. Nice. So a $6,000 lease on a terminal nice. worth like 115 Right. right. <laughs> um, and you know what's so funny about it is, Patty, they literally on the bottom of this terminal, they had a custom created like sticker. Uh -huh. It was uh, uh, more than a sticker, but it was like a piece of plastic with a sticker on it that said Quantum 2000. Which sounds really exciting, too. Right. right? Well, the yeah. reason they did that is they stuck it over the bottom. So when you would go to look for the Quantum 2000, well, the only thing you find online is their website. Oh, and it's like, wow. oh, wow, that must be worth a lot of money. If you actually search for the Hypercom you know, 4220, right. it would say $115 on Amazon, right? Right. Sure, sure. Well, here's what happened, Patty. So true story, I'm installing one of these terminals one day and the sticker fell off. So no. I'm like, what's a hypercom? So I, <laughs> I looked it up and I'm like, oh crap, I've been leasing these terminals for six thousand dollars that are worth, you know, like a hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, and so I wasn't very happy about that. And you know what's funny, Betty? I'll I'll be honest with everybody because I'm 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 a greedy capitalist. Okay, that's the way it goes. So, you know, the, the honest truth is I'm not sure what I was more upset about. The fact that I had been selling a hundred and fifteen dollar terminal for six thousand dollars. Or, or the fact that my commission on it was 500 bucks. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> <You know>? right. <laughs> I was like, look, I can sell this at like $50 a month. Like, you know, I am I can, you know, I can work with this, but you're gonna have to give me more than 500 bucks, you know? Anyway, I was pretty upset about that. So um, long story short, left them, went to another company, very reputable, everybody would know, and started building a book of business with them. But I very quickly realized there wasn't a lot of training out there in the industry. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. There just wasn't a lot out there. So I started the YouTube channel. This is back before it was cool to be a YouTuber. So that's when you started the YouTube channel, really when you were still pretty new in I this was, business, I was probably right? only six months into the business, I would say. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I had a passion for sales training. I didn't have any employees at that time. Right. Um, so I had I one, I had an assistant um, doing the paperwork and stuff. Um, so then I started building it out. Uh, and initially I built it the way I monetized the channel was, um, cause it took off really fast. Like everybody, mm -hmm. it turned out everybody was looking for this or information, somebody who did that, how payment right? processing works and all that. Um, because what was happening at that time still happens today to a lesser extent, but all these companies were recruiting people like crazy into the industry, but they weren't training them. Right. Right. right? So, mean, the, so the, people, yeah. the people would come in they, and they'd go, oh, they got recruited in and it's a great opportunity. And then they'd go, oh, OK, well, how do I do it? And they mm -hmm. go look online and they wouldn't find anything. So as soon as my YouTube video started going out. Right. Every, I mean, they just started blowing up. I still have some on. I, I've left a few of the old ones on YouTube. I've from, seen some of your old ones, but yeah, it's really funny really when ones. I view those because I used to meet a lot of people when I first came into this into this part of the business said, oh, the green sheet. When I got my job with XYZ, they gave me a stack of green sheets like this right, and told right. me to read through them. And that yeah. was all the training I got. Right. Um, I was like, 
this was before you came along, uh, obviously, right. but it was true. That was what yeah. all the kind of training some people were getting. Yeah, it's crazy. And and so, you know, what's the green sheet is such a great resource. I know a lot of people I've talked to that when they got into the industry back then, you know, they would they got literally nothing. I mean, like when I got into the industry, I got a two hour webinar. Um, well, that's better than most people. And and all that webinar was was how to sell the Quantum 2000. Right. <laughs> right. right. Um, mm -hmm. And they just said, oh, just tell them that we'll save them a ton of money on their processing. And I'm like, and they didn't say how much or how to it was just, right, no, right, just tell right. them we'll save them a bunch of money. It's about the Quantum 2000, you know. So, um, yeah. So anyway, uh, I started that and then I would monetize it by recruiting agents. So I would say, hey, if you're interested in this, you know, I have a company I recommend. And then I would send them to a company that would give me an override. Okay. Um, I, I did that several times. Um, then I ended up uh, building my own ISO. We had a, we had two different national ISOs. The second one I built, we were doing about 200 deals a month. Um, and then I sold that back to TSIS, uh, one of their ISOs a long time, uh, seven years ago now. Um, and then since then, it's been all consulting, training, and software companies. And of course, now it's much more about the software companies than anything right, else. Right, right. Let's yeah. go back just a spec, if you would, because you said you you got, had this ISO, you were doing about 200 deals a month. How many people did you have working for you at that time? So we had 31, 32 full-time employees. So we had- 30, uh, okay. Yeah, we probably had about uh, 700, 1099 agents that um, where, you know, of those maybe, like everybody understands with 1099, maybe 200 right. were somewhat active, with, right, you know, sure. 30, 35 that were really doing something serious, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. So, okay. So say, you know, put yourself back in that, in that time period. I'm just curious, you know, what your typical work day looked like, you know, how often you went out and, and how long it really took you to build that portfolio. Was it, a, was mm. it a real struggle or, I mean, or was it something that you just ran with? Uh, it was definitely, it, it was a struggle because I didn't understand what I was doing. Okay. As soon okay. as I figured it out, it was like, oh, this is actually pretty easy. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, initially the real struggle was that I, I had to sell the lease. <laughs> right, so right. that was a little harder. Um, you know, yeah. I was able to do it, but it was it was a little tricky. Um, but, you know, I would speak. But then when I you would, started selling services more generally. More with residual. Then the only challenge is, like everybody else, is that delay in residual. Because right. I started doing pretty good about the fourth month. I was like, oh, well, I think I got, I don't know, I think I had at least 17 deals my fourth month. Uh-huh. But the thing was, even though I had 17 deals the fourth month, you know, it's like I wasn't making any money yet. And then right. it, that didn't come in until month like six. I started actually getting residual from that. Right. So it right. took a good six months. And even then, I mean, I was used to making a lot of money. Like in my previous career, I was like, sure. you know, six figure kind of person. Right. So, you know, at, at that time, uh, upfront bonuses wasn't a big thing. And so mm -hmm. there was really no upfront money. You were just building this residual and it was very painful. Yeah. Um, for me, Patty, the, the, you know, my day was, was actually pretty simple. So um, I told Christina, my wife, I told her, um, I said, Hey, if I'm still in the house at nine o'clock or if I'm back to the house before five o'clock, just know we're probably not gonna be able to pay our bills. So mm. I want to keep me out. You know, that's what she right. would do. It'd be like, you know, it'd be like eight 45 and I'm like, you know, still working on something at the house. And she's like, Hey, like, are you, are you heading out? <laughs> you know? Right. Right. Uh, later, later on when, uh, you know, when I started having kids, I had them play that role as well. Like I would do a thing where every day when I would come home, they would ask me how many sales I made that day. Oh, that's a um, great idea. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I would tell them that every time I made a sale, we're saving up money to go to Disney world, you know, that mm -hmm. type of thing. And so they'd be very disappointed if I came home and I hadn't made a sale. So I try right. not to disappoint my kids. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it was really simple. I just went out in the field and I walked into businesses all day and I sold payment processing, um, very much the old fashioned way, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, a lot I, of pizza shops. A lot of pizza shops. I was big into pizza shops, as you know. Yeah. Um, but I would sell anybody on anything. I mean, it, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, the other thing I, I definitely was able to use back then is I had other expertise, again, on the on the tech side. I remember um, that, right. QuickBooks was a big deal for QuickBooks you, QuickBooks right? was a real big deal. I was QuickBooks certified. So I was able to go in and help people more kind of operationally a little bit mm -hmm, um, for mm -hmm. free as just kind of like, hey, it's a good idea to be in a relationship with me. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, my days back then were, you know, the other thing I will say too, I've always been... I've always had this weird thing where if you asked anybody, Patty, that like would knows me or works with me, they would all tell you James is so organized. Uh huh. But yeah, I force you do. I think you're very organized. But I'm not. You've not seen my desk though, James. But, <laughs> but but what I've always I've been really yours. yeah. What I've always been really good at is is hiring the right people uh -huh. and yeah. getting people to fill in. So you know, Angela was my first assistant, and mm -hmm. I mean back then. We actually, and she's in the building right now, actually. But, you know, we had a, uh, I had this little app on my phone. Mm -hmm. Every time I would get done with a conversation, a phone call, a meeting, whatever it is, I had this app where I'd pull up the app, tap this button to do a voice note. 
And I'd say, hey, I just talked to Bill at XYZ company. He said I should follow up in the afternoon and when Susan's there, whatever. And I would just, once I untapped record, it would automatically send her an email. Oh, wow. So right? she didn't, then she'd put it into your yep. system for you. And right? then all I've done, I mean, literally, if, if I had to name the biggest factor of my success actually has been that every day, I, I kind of consider myself as, as best I can, I try to be a robot during the day. And what I mean by that is, just give me the instructions and I just yeah. do that. So I, I wake up in the morning, I look at my calendar and I'm like, this is what I'm doing today. And somebody else plans my day. And that's been the case for me for a long time mm -hmm. because I'm not organized. Most salespeople aren't either. I'm just not detail oriented yeah. enough to do it. Yeah. Um, but I would do that. And I just had this discipline of after every time I would send it. And then she would basically route my day, plan what I was doing. Um, I got some telemarketers eventually to start calling and helping me schedule appointments and stuff. So I really... I focused on building like a team around me to make myself mm -hmm. more productive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's what I did first before I was like, Oh, let me go hire more salespeople. Let me go hire more, whatever. It's like, no, like I just want to make myself really productive and like work really hard myself. Right. Which is something that you've said a lot on the, on the podcast. If you're really good at sales, you yeah. don't want to go out and hire another salesperson and train them and, and, right. you know, make less money. You want to hire people who are going to be, keep you out there selling. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people get burned out with sales. And and I mean, I understand that, but I mean, unless you're making a ton of money where you can really scale something, uh, it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. So, you know, James, this tends to be a business that changes all the time and then it changes back, you know, yeah. uh, 1099s versus W2s. Um, I know you've seen that, um, you know, going public, then going back private. That's something we've seen right. in this industry. What are the two or maybe three most significant changes that you've seen in your career um, hmm. selling, you know, in the merchant services part of your career? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, to me, selling merchant services has shifted almost entirely as a result of technology, mm -hmm. right? And so I think, um, and, and what I mean by that is that's impacted everything. Right. So, so like, for instance, the sales process itself, itself, mm -hmm. you know, when I started, mm -hmm. I got pretty good at doing a one call close. I wouldn't say probably a third of my deals were one call close. I know guys who were like 90% one call close. Yeah, I knew I was, some of those guys. I was in awe of them. Yeah. I'm, I've never been that, that way, but I would do some sometimes. Um, but it was a very short sales cycle. I was very good at it. You know, it was, mm -hmm. it was very intentional. I would do, usually I would do two visits and I would close on the second one. Mm -hmm. Um, but then when it started being like, okay, now I got to go sell full feature point of sale systems. That got a little tricky, right? Then yeah, it was a, yeah. a, you know, so it got harder and harder. And then and it was the more thing, of a learning experience too. Yeah. Right? You're, you're selling yeah. a solution. You got to become the expert. You got to answer questions that are harder. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you do have to go back and get more information before you can really make the full right. pitch. Right. So that was a big, that's been a big shift. I feel like over the years and that's impacted everything. Then you look at verticalization, which layers mm -hmm. on top of that. Mm -hmm. And now this vertical specific software, it's even changed the way you would go target. Now I was, I was actually pretty early into that. Right. Right. I remember uh, yeah. yeah. With with the pizza shops as you already brought up. Right. You know, I, I remember vividly like designing my own pizza shop payment professional business. I remember, cards. right? Yes. Yeah. And so I would go out and like, hey, I'm the guy you want to help you with your pizza shop point of sale or whatever. I'm your pizza payments guy. Exactly. And <laughs> yeah. and that that worked fantastic for me. Um, you know, and so I think I think, you know, I learned really early on the value of the verticals. I mean, I did that because I mainly I was doing it back then for two reasons. One is I realized that people wanted point of sale systems, but I didn't want to learn like every point of sale system in existence. Sure, sure. So I found a company that I really liked with a point of sale uh, for pizza shops. Mm -hmm. So I got pretty good at that one. And that was like, okay, that's the only one I really need to know. Everybody, I would still go sell everybody else, but I would sell terminals. Right. But I would really focus on point of sale. So you only just focus on point shops. of sale with the pizza shops. And right. so every pizza shop um, for 30 mile radius around Duncanville. Exactly. Probably it was your market, right? Exactly. And then, and then the other thing I, I really uh, would say though, is the other reason I really did that also is just because like, you know, you get so many referrals. Like when you're out selling one particular thing like that, you just get really deep into it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was pretty rare for me to close a deal where I didn't get another deal from that. So they would say, uh -huh. oh, hey, you need really to go great. talk to my cousin, Tony, or, you know, like, yeah, and so that right, happens. Right. So I feel like you just kind of got this flywheel momentum, which was really interesting. It worked out that way because it really gave me a lot of perspective because today I feel like it's almost a necessity to sell like that. Right. Um, it wasn't back then. But it wasn't back then. No, yeah. it's just, it's just the way that I, that I did it. But you know what? Let me, let's, you know, let's turn it around for a second. What are your thoughts on this? What are, I mean, you've been, well, in the I was just, so when you were talking about that, it was kind of percolating on my mind. You know, yeah, when I wrote this question up, what I saw as the biggest changes. Now, of course, the biggest changes in my career, which was before payments, was the electronic authorization. Yeah, I mean, of course. Yes. 
I remember back in the early 80s, MasterCard bringing me out to show me the center. And it was like I was married at the time to a man who worked for for uh, NASA. I thought I was at another NASA building, you know, with the right, maps right. and everything. But aside from that, I would say probably, you know, one of the biggest changes to me was the debit card. Mm, OK. OK. Before debit cards came out, even when they did come out, everybody thought of them as ATM cards. Right. Debit for the point of sale never really came into existence until about the mid nineties. Huh. Um, and, and, and originally it was promoted these low, these regional ATM networks would go around and sell debit acceptance to merchants. Hmm. It wasn't even the credit card guys that were selling. So debit acceptance wasn't going any place. Wow. And then some of these, some of the bigger banks started tr- striking deals with Visa and MasterCard. Hey, what about we put your logo on our debit card and yeah and then it went from there so that was a big change for me um e-commerce again i think these all tie into technology james you know but sure the idea i remember interviewing somebody because just for background for people i started out as a reporter and i happened some of the earliest jobs i had uh in in back in those days professionals lawyers and bankers would buy specialized newsletters at that time, they were just passing all the laws and regulations for EFT and consumer protections. Sure. Sure. So I became an expert on that, you know, following all those footsteps. So I think that um, what, I, what I was going to say was I interviewed this guy back in maybe 1981, 82. He was at the Fed. I was interviewing him about what they called at the time home banking. Hmm. And he said to me, you know, you're going to get to the point everything's going to be done through your television set. They'll do everything <laughs> except hand you the cash. That's, well, he was almost right. He was I almost mean, right. The screen is going to be a little smaller, but yeah. Screen's going to be a little smaller, but it is a screen. And he had right. the kind of the That's idea. The right idea. Yeah. Right. And I I would say another really big change that kind of feeds into to, to the e-commerce is real-time payments. Sure. I mean, yeah. we're not there yet, but I never would have thought we'd get there. I remember covering Fed meetings and, you know, those people are some of the stodgiest regulators you ever want to meet. And the idea that they would, you know, go to something, um, you know, allow the payment system to be that fast. Yeah. um, Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's, I think there's so much market pressure in this case from other countries. From other countries. Well, it was the same when we had smart cards, you know, smart card or what we call, what were called smart cards, but, you know, uh, chip cards Mm -hmm. were very popular in Europe when we were still, when we were just starting with MagStripe because they didn't have the telecom structure to deal with MagStripe, you know? So Hmm. anyway, so let me ask you this, James, Um, you know, you, you talked about turning to training, but as everybody who listens to you and knows you knows that, you know, you have a consulting business. That's obviously an outgrowth of this. You have your, um, um, ISOAMP. ISOAMP and uh, the ISO Alliance, which you're forming, which mm-hmm. you've been working on. You also have your own um, company uh, doing, you know, an ISV of sorts, I guess right. you would call it, right? For um, right. I, I, actually have, I actually have three, but nobody knows about the other two. But Okay. Yeah. Well, the one I know is about <laughs> self-storage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So just give us a sense, if you would, you know, um, how did this all come? How, I mean, it seems to me almost like you have like this giant smorgasbord, mm-hmm. you know, you, you come yeah, into the, work and you have a the, giant what's the thread. Yeah. What's the thread that ties it all together. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah I think, um, you know, it, my business has evolved and I mean, I've been really, really blessed, you know? Um, and mm-hmm. I, I think, I think a couple things about it. One is there's a few, you know, the way, the way I look at the, it is is this, <clears throat> if you want to be really successful, you have to latch on to a bet. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, look at Jeff Bezos, he mm-hmm. made the bet that people would buy things online. Right. That was his big bet. Now, what does he sell? Everything. Right. Started right? off with books, but then everything. Right. right. And so his idea is there's a bet of when to go online. Right. And so I've made a few bets uh, over the years. I think the two biggest ones for me have been number one, that content strategy works. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a really important thread that actually ties all of my businesses together. When you look at what we right. do, sure. whether it's with the ISVs, you know, you look at CC storage, you know, we have the self storage insight podcast. Mm -hmm. We're about to start a Facebook group. We have all this blog. We have the, you know, we have a lot of content strategy going on there. Um, mm -hmm. CC sales pro, you know, driven entirely by content, content. strategy. Sure. Um, right. And so, and these other things that we're doing now that nobody knows about are, you know, which I'll, I'm sure I'll talk about in a year or so, but um, these things are all driven by content strategy. So that's really important. And the second big bet is verticalization. Yes. Yes. And so You're the first person I ever heard talk about verticalization, I must admit. Yeah. And it's, yeah. I've, I'm making a huge bet on it. And when I say huge bet, I mean, <laughs> I literally mean that, you know, I have the money that I know that I want to live on for my family and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, it's funny. I, I'll share this. I probably shouldn't share this, but I will. Um, I had a meeting with my finance person uh, a couple of days ago. Right. Uh -huh. And basically what she told me was, you know, long and short of it is as long as I don't come into work, then we'll be fine. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, we have these businesses that each have a CEO, right. That, that run right. themselves and is, you know, I can come in and do my podcast recording. Right. But as long as, cause when I come to work, what I do is I start, you start a new business and I grow things <laughs> and I hire people. And she's like, as long as we don't do any of that, like I'm basically set, you know, I could make the amount of money that I want to make and, and it would grow a double, triple every year. And you know what I mean? Oh, right, right, right. I can go live on an Island. You know what I mean? Um, right. And, you know, that made me like nauseous, you know, I was like, what in the world? That's not what I want. Right. So it's like, oh man, we got to start the next one. Here we go. So, uh, you know, I'm literally taking, you know, all of the money that I've, I, I make on these cash cow businesses that I have now, like the statement analysis is turning into a cash cow, obviously mm -hmm. CC sales pro, the consulting, um, you know, things of that nature. And I'm just dumping all of it into this bet on vertical specific payment, you know, integrated payments. Um, mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, right now, everybody knows CC storage because I talk about it so much. There's two others that are like way bigger bets than that. And so everybody will know more about that down the road. But, um, but yeah, I'm just putting everything into that because I kind of feel like over the next 20 years, um, the things I know, the things that I, I, I believe in, and again, I could be wrong. I mean, I'm not, you know, I know I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. But the, the two bets I'm going to keep going with is going to be number one, content strategy is going to continue to be super effective. And 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 so, right. and, 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 you know, and I put a lot into that. People say that like they believe it, but they don't. And the way I know mm -hmm. they don't is they don't put any money into making content. No, they don't. I can they, tell you that because I deal with tons of money like on, all the time. Yeah. They, then they spend all this money on direct legion. But when right. you look at like, you know, like CC storage as an example, that business right now loses like now I think we're up to probably $70,000 a month that we, that that business is, is an invest. I'm investing that much into the business, right? right. I'm the only investor, but that's like the, the loss of that business. And, you know, out of that, you know, I'm making such a huge bet because I'm building this audience of self storage right. property managers and I'm not even involved. I mean, I have somebody else doing all of it, but we're putting everything into creating that audience because I know that in three to five years, nobody will be able to compete with me in that market mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I will have the largest audience and the largest email list and the largest social right. media following and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I believe at scale, that's a really, really big, big thing. And you, you layer that on top of the verticalization, which is what makes it effective because it's so targeted. Sure, sure. Okay, so let's wrap this up. I mean, we've been, we could talk forever about ourselves sure. and each other, but sure. let's talk about, I, I think people would really appreciate it, James. You know, I meet so many people who, who talk to me about how much they've learned from you and how much they've learned from our podcast. And, and I thought it would be really interesting if maybe you could give two or three qualities. I mean, you talked about the two bets that you made, you know, mm -hmm. and that people have sure. to make bets. And of course it is a gamble. Business is a gamble. And yeah. of course you have to make bets. But that takes a certain type of person. You know, what are the two or three qualities you believe are the necessary ingredients for success in merchant sales itself? You know, either from the agent's perspective and or the ISO perspective. Sure. I mean, I think I would say they're different, actually. I would say for the salesperson, I think that it is about prospecting. Mm -hmm. But even further from that, it is about a consistent repetitive action that you have complete control over mm -hmm. that you're able to go out and, and create interest by mm -hmm. interrupting people. Right. I mean, it, it doesn't sound nice, but it's the truth. And so I, what I find when I talk to salespeople, I'm like, they're like, I'm like, what are you going to do? And they're like, well, I'm thinking about doing some Instagram direct messages. I'm thinking about doing some LinkedIn direct messages. I'm, I thought about going door to door, but I, and it's like, look, I don't even care. Just do it. You have to pick right. one and you have Just to do it every day for four to six hours. 
right? Every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the next week, you do it again. You have to do it every single day. So pick something that works and you're going to do it for like two, three years mm -hmm. and you got a prospect right now. Again, for me, I've always made that additional bit of content. So I would like to, I would grab email addresses as well as prospecting. And then I would do my monthly email newsletter and all that. But you know, it's another thing. For the ISOs, I think that the word right now, the main thing that, that the, the successful ones are doing is they're focusing, yeah. Yeah, right? And so focus in every area, focusing on a vertical, focusing on a set of solutions, focusing right. on one particular model of distribution that's working and being, you know, being the best at having a two-layer call center or being the best at having outside 1099s or W2s or whatever, but you got to focus and you got to like dominate that thing. And I know mm -hmm. it's funny advice coming from me because I have so many different businesses now. Um, right. But you, you to, but you, <laughs> but you have to, them. but you have to remember that in each of those businesses, I have a CEO running that company right. that is laser focused on that one and only one thing. And you know what I mean? That's how you have to build it out. That's how I built my business initially. Now mm -hmm. I'm more of an investor, right. An advisor to these companies, but it's like, you have to build up with focus. Otherwise you're not going to be successful. That's great advice, James. Thank you so much. This has been kind of, I really enjoyed this. I hope you have as well. And yeah, it's been great, Patty. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. So Patty, today's episode is brought to you by Nativia Banking. Um, we just talked about, uh, we're talking about Goldman Sachs today, mm -hmm. right? And right. Uh, there's a reason that Apple is uh, getting into the banking side of things. Yes, and there's there a reason that, that ISO should be looking into it as well. So if you want to learn more about that, head over to nativia.com slash ISO, I-S-O. So nativia.com slash ISO. Learn more about their banking solutions and what you can do to start making money and residual income off of the money your merchants are spending, not just the money that they're accepting in payments. Yes, the uh, concept that they like to use is banking as a service, and that is a service that you can provide your merchants in addition to credit card services. Absolutely. And with that being said, let's dive back into our episode. So, James, uh, Goldman Sachs has found itself on the outside looking back in at retail payments. Really? Um, yeah. It's a much ballyhooed partnership with Apple is on the skids. Okay. Uh, according to reporting by the Wall Street Journal and others, Apple pulled the plug um, and uh, wants to be divested within 12 to 15 months. Not just wow. the Apple card, but the savings account, uh, which had this, you know, mon monstrously high interest rate. I think they were paying almost 5%. Um, on checking account, you know, on savings accounts and right. also the buy now, pay later business. Oh, wow. So Goldman, uh, you know, a lot of people may not know a lot about Goldman because it's been an investment bank for the most, most of its career. Right. It, but it's has spent the last eight years trying to shed its image as a stodgy bank for big corporations and big money individuals. And the Apple card was, was pivotal, pivotal to the strategy. But mm -hmm. earlier in this year, the bank disclosed that it accumulated, this blows my mind, $4 billion in losses in its consumer banking franchise in just three years. Wow. And, um, and hope, it also- hope, hope it was worth it for all that good branding. <laughs> right? And they also attracted a lot of scrutiny from regulators, both the CFPB and the sure. Federal Reserve was looking at it for, yeah. for uh, lapses in consumer lending regulation. Right. right. Um. It wasn't exactly a good marriage from the get-go. Apple was said to have put a lot of demands on Goldman, like agreeing not to charge late fees or sell customer data. Right. It also wanted everybody approved. So at one point I read the average FICO score for an Apple car, or you know, not the average, but they were accepting FICO scores as low as 650. Oh, yeah. Which oh. is pretty low. Mm -hmm. Um the, Goldman also was took offense at the fact that early ads described the card as designed by Apple, not a bank. Um, right. <laughs> I could right. see that. Uh, Goldman has been said to be in discussions with several big names in consumer payments to take over its Apple card portfolio and related businesses. Hmm. American Express is one. Synchrony Financial, which ironically yeah. lost in bidding to be the gold to be the uh, card issuer for Apple. Wow. Um, it's also been um, trying to position itself as a bank with close ties to tech. It has a card issuing agreement with um, Amazon as well as with PayPal, I believe. Huh. Uh, Chase is also um, a possibility. They already are a top card issuer as well as a top acquirer. Right. 
you know, the news is a real setback for Apple, which has been trying to build serv its services business as iPhone sales begin to slow. According to the Wall Street Journal, uh, in its last quarterly report, Apple revealed that overall sales were down by less than 1% year over year, but revenues for services posted a 16% gain. Right. So, so, so I guess maybe I didn't fully understand the structure of that deal. I have to look into that more now. So you're saying yeah. that you're saying that, you know, in, in what way is this a hit to Apple exactly? Well, because they have nobody right now to help them to back up. They don't have an issuing bank, basically. Right. Right. I and, see. And they I mean, want I can't to, imagine they wanna be they want to get into financial services and they well, have right. to have a decent bank partner to do that. Well, sure, but I can't imagine that's gonna be a tough find. I mean um I don't apparently know. I mean I did a lot of reading on this. I did a you know a lot of um analyst reports on this. Right. And a lot of them are saying that this Apple card is just a real bomb. Hmm. Um, wow. you know, you have low you have low FICO scores, you have high um acceptance rates, you you know. There's a lot of chargeback activity. Um, and one of the things that really uh, some bankers were complaining about is Apple was insisting, insists that all statements go out on the first of the month, whereas a lot of banks are doing it later in the month. Mm. So it totally messes up their their schedules. Right. right. You know, it's things like that, that yeah. the banks are just not, you know, it's like yeah. Apple is trying to play its domineering role and the banks are balking back. I mean, in the end, it was only Goldman Sachs, an old investment bank that took up the offer of the Apple card. You know, I guess, I guess to me, the thing that I find surprising is that Apple doesn't just take more of this in house. I mean, why? Yeah. Like it, why, why can't, I mean, with, why with the way it start its own bank? Well, yeah, I mean, maybe that's a little too far as far as actually having a charter bank, but I mean, they could, you know, there's so much with the, the, um, you know, banking as a service and all that, where I would imagine they could probably find it, which again, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't play at that level, but I would imagine yeah. there's, there's, I would imagine that this whole experience and knowing, you know, Tim Cook, you know, who runs Apple is, is very much the control freak. Right. I would imagine that they're going to probably, uh, their next deal, I imagine will protect them from future issues like this. <laughs> oh, I think, I think so. And yeah. I think what it was, and, and this is sort of my reason for bringing this, this story up is that I think it portrays a picture that we see a lot of technology companies thinking that they can get into financial services and that's going to be a breeze. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of history here, a lot of regulatory requirements that folks from the outside just don't understand. Yeah. And it wasn't just Apple that was out of its league, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Goldman was was an investment bank. It had no experience in retail payments. Right. You know, right. so I think that that's it. Yeah, I agree that Apple could take more of this in-house, but I think they have to understand the business. I think this was right. their effort to understand the business. Yeah. And I will say they they do tend to learn pretty quickly though. So. They do. Well, they are tech. <laughs> they are technologists, and technologists usually have a faster, higher, steeper learning curve. Yeah, yeah. Though, yeah. though, I I think Tim Cook will wrap his arms around this pretty quickly. I mean, they they've made so much money from this already from the from the payment side and all that that I mean. Oh, I'm know, sure they'll find you know. something. But yeah, yeah, this was this was just really interesting, interesting. to me because I think it sort yeah. of shows that technology bank chasm that still that mm. the old players still haven't been able to navigate. No, they haven't. Yeah, that'll, it'll be very interesting to see how it all plays out, Patty. Sure.